Well, good afternoon. It's 26 October 2018. I'm Jay Waters. I'm with the Americans in Wartime Oral History Project. Today we're up in Paramus, New Jersey, and I have the pleasure of meeting Mr. Lewis Kasbar. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. If you would, please, could you just give us your full name and what year you were born? My name is Lewis Kasbar. in Palisade Park, New Jersey. And what war did you participate in? What war? Yes. What year? Well, you were in World War II, correct? I couldn't hear too well. What, what, what war did you participate in? I see your hat says- in World War II. Right, and what years did you serve? 1943 to 46. Did you have any family members, parents, brothers, or sisters that ser served in the military before you? I had, I had three other brothers in the military. My, uh, my oldest brother, John, my oldest brother, Nick, and my youngest brother, Anthony. Were they in, the, what, what branch of service were they in? Well, Anthony was a bomber, a, a, a tail bomber. Nicholas fought in Africa with, the, uh, with Patton, and he was in the tank corps. And John never went overseas, served in his service in this country. I went overseas in November of 40, 43 and could return in January of 46. Okay. And so let's think about for a second, December 7th, 1941. Where, Pearl Harbor. Yeah, where, where were you? And just can you tell us what Where was that I that day? Yes. I was in Burgerline Avenue in a theater. Uh, the Ritz Theater on Burgerline Avenue in uh, North Bergen. And we were watching a picture, and the screen went off, and it announced that we were attacked in Pearl Harbor. And I said, I said to my fiancé then, well, I won't be seeing you long because I'll be going to war. And uh, lo and behold, I was drafted. So you were 20 years old, right, at the time? I was, uh, well, I was 22. 22, okay, okay. But so at the, at the movie theater, did they stop the movie to announce the attack? In the military? No, on December 7th, 1941, when you were at the movies, did they stop the movie? Yes, they did. Okay. They stopped the movie. I made an announcement that we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, and uh, the movie was closed. They closed it. Let us go home. Okay, that's interesting. So, why did you enter the military service? I think you just said you, you got drafted. Is that correct? I was drafted. Uh, funny thing, they had a lot of with numbers, and my number was. And the, on the draft board, 519. That was the first number they picked, 519. Really? Wow. So how did, how did that work then, after you got notified well, of the draft? Well, I was drafted in November. It was the day before Thanksgiving. And they gave me Thanksgiving off, and I had to report to Fort Dix on the 26th of November. 1943, the day after Thanksgiving. And when I got there, they gave me an examination at Fort Dix. I didn't like it at all because half the time you were nude running around, they would examine you, and they, and they, uh, let you, they never told you what they found or anything, but uh, I knew that we were in big trouble that I was going to be in the service. Well, what else, what else did you do at Fort Dix for, for training? What else? 
uh, uh, nothing too much. I just prepared myself to go into the service, and uh, leave him was a very bad thing. I loved my mother, and my father was, uh, and, and they, there were three other ones in before me. Now that's four from one family, that's a lot. And uh, my mom was very concerned about me. And I'll tell you why. She was more concerned about me because I was the only one in the Casbah family named after her father. His name was Louis Carano. And my father named the, all my other brothers and sisters after his side of the family. And I was the only one named on the side of my mother's family. And I didn't know my paternal grandfather. I didn't know him. But I knew my grandmother. Her name was Rosemary Carano. She was married to Luigi Carano, which is an Italian translated to Louis Casper, Louis Carano. So that's why they named me Louis. Did you have any friends or, or neighbors, other guys from the neighborhood that got drafted and went to Fort Dix with you? No. No. Did you make friends, though, at training? Yes. Okay. So after Fort Dix, did you get any additional training? After I what? After Fort Dix, where did you go next? From Fort Dix, I went to Camp Lee, Virginia. Okay. What did you do at Camp Lee? Took my basic training for nine weeks. Got up every morning at 5 o'clock. I went to bed at 11 o'clock at night. We were half of us. There was a forest down there, I forget the name. We had to stay a guard in the forest at night, regardless of what the weather was. If it rained, snowed, what? You would still on guard. Anything ever happen while you were doing guard duty in the forest? No. Nothing? And then any other training after Fort Lee, or what happened next? After, after Camp Lee? Camp Lee, yes. Well... We were, we were ordered to go overseas, and uh, I, believe, uh, I believe we left in November, and we were on, I was, we were on a ship called the USS Smith-Thompson, and it took like a month on the, uh, going over on a boat, on a ship, because of the U-boats. Uh, German U-boats, and, and uh, we spent a lot of time on a ship. We landed in the Fort of, Fort of Clyde in England, near Liverpool. Anything interesting from the ship voyage? Any, anything? Well, other, on a trip. You couldn't go down and in, in, inside the ship because you got seasick. It was hot, yeah. you know. And we uh, used to shoot crap, play cards, and we made our own dice out of the insides of bread. The guys would square them off in their hand, yeah. get them hard, and then you put numbers on them, and that's what we used for dice. Really, I've, I've never heard that. Wow, that's, uh, that's yeah, it's nice. just true. Yeah. Could you, could you eat the dice later if you wanted to? <laughs> they, they got hard. They used to fall apart, but the guys used to put it together again. Wow. And um, what, what specialty, what job did you have with the Army? What? what? What was your job in the Army? My job? We were in 3575 Porter Master Truck delivering supplies. Now, when you deliver supplies, that's the first unit the, uh, the, the, uh, the Germans were looking for. They would want to take out the supply line so the soldiers couldn't fight. You know, you got your food, you got your ammunition, you got your guns, you got your clothes, you got your medications, all on the supply, and we delivered them. Were you, were you a driver on the truck? I, I used to drive it once in a while. It was a six by six uh, truck. And 
if, if the driver got tired, somebody else took over. And I drove him a couple of times in uh, Mitch and Hampton, England, and in Southern England. Uh, I drove the trucks a lot of times. And then uh, did you go in at Normandy? Did I go where? To, uh, how did you get into France? Where did, where did you go after? Oh, well, we went to France. We went, we stood in, Eng in England. I took some basic training. While we were in England, the Germans were bombing London and other any, any parts of England. And uh, we went, we were shipped from Mitch and Hampton where I took some training, and we were shipped to southern England, off the English Channel, waiting for a ship to take us over the English Channel into France. And it was a funny thing. The channel was only 35, 40 miles long. It took us like five days because the ships went up and down, up and down, vertically, of course, until we got to the channel, the end of the channel. Now, when we got to the, the end of the channel, that was on June 10th, 1944, four days after the invasion, we landed in Normandy. So what was it like arriving in Normandy? What was it like arriving in Normandy? Oh, it wasn't pleasant, I'll tell you. There was 4,400 soldiers on the ship. And uh, when they invaded uh, Normandy, June 6, 44. I went on June 10, 44, and, it, and we only had a three mile beachhead. And the very thing that kept us out were the girders that Hitler had put in the ground on the Normandy beach. And uh, the very thing that kept us out was the very thing that got us in. We used those girders to hide behind, and they couldn't. They would, they would have bunkers on top. It was in depth, I think. D P P E. It's easy to shoot down on you, but it's so difficult to shoot up at anybody. So, when we hid behind the girders, a lot of guys got killed. A lot of guys got killed, and uh, we stood behind the girders until our air force. P-38s, uh, fighter, fighter bombers, were bombing these bunkers. But the Seabees scaled the mountain on ropes and climbed and threw hand grenades into bunkers so we could advance further in. Right. Do you remember what beach you landed on? Do you remember what beach you landed on? What? Which beach? Oh, I was on, uh, there was four beaches, Utah, Omaha, Judo and sword. I was on Omaha, the American beach. Okay, on June 10th. So then, did you get your trucks ashore as well? Or were you waiting for your trucks? The military truck? Yeah, did the trucks come sh ashore on June 10th as well? Well, or? there wasn't any trucks because we just was invading. Right. And uh, the ship was three, uh, three miles out, 300 feet deep water. And how we knew that, how the, the Americans knew that, was they had French fishermen go and fish and measure the depth, how far out they was. And uh, I couldn't swim a foot, and I still can't swim a foot. And I had to go over the rope ladder, and I told my lieutenant, his name was Seymour Salzman, from Jersey City, one of the nicest guys you ever want to meet. I said, Seymour, I can't swim. So he says, well, then you're going to drown. I said, well, that's the end of the war for me. But 
uh, what, what really saved me was going in on the beach with my pup tent. I had it draped over my neck and tied, and I kind of floated. But the rest of the guys were pushing me in because they knew I couldn't swim. When I hit the beach, we only had a three-mile beachfront, you know. I felt the sand underneath me, and I walked in. I got behind a girder, and uh, I stood there until uh, we were told to advance ahead. Did you see any Germans in these, these first days? Did you see any German soldiers these first days? Oh, yeah. There was a lot of German soldiers. They were up all on, they were up on a mountain. I saw them after we left the beach. I climbed the mountain and went over where the bunkers were. That was in uh, uh, Normandy. And they had left, but when they left, they, they left a lot of landmines, a lot of different things so we couldn't advance. But our engineer department, the engineers, had the Geiger counters and they would explode the bombs before anybody got there. So uh, what happened as, as you were in Normandy and you started to break out from Normandy? Well, when we, when we uh, scaled the mountain in Normandy, went up on a beach, I know, we started, the Germans left. They left. But they left a lot of landmines, hand grenades. They, they any anything they could disrupt you. And uh, we had what they call the landmine. Long, it was a, like a, a long uh, oh, tank, and it had it had in the front. It had all the things. And it would set the bombs off, and that way we followed the tanks all the way in. When we got to Normandy, after Normandy, uh, our next encounter with the Germans was in St. Mary, Greece. They put a lot of resistance up, but they couldn't compare with what we had because the Germans, uh, the Germans had so many soldiers for Normandy Beach, and they had soldiers all over the place. And uh, we, the German, the English come on Sword Beach. They came in from the east. We come up from this. We were on Omaha, Omaha, Utah. We come up on the south. And the Canadians come from the west on, on Juno Beach. And uh, I believe that's the way it was. And, Germans didn't have a shot. They didn't have a shot because we were fresh and they were old from years and years being there. I'll tell you a story. We had no food. We couldn't get food. We, we ate out of cans, uh, sea ration cans. And uh, on the other side of Normandy, there was a farmer. We shot a cow. <laughs> and the butchers butchered it up, and we, we ate for about a week beef, but we had to pay for the cow. It was $200, so all the guys shipped in and paid for the cow. The farmer was hollering like, like oh, you couldn't believe. The old French, who don't understand him, we didn't understand him. But we ate other than that. That's an expensive cow, though, $200. That yeah. <laughs> uh, must have been good food, though. Yeah. Uh, Anything else? It wasn't about? fun. It wasn't fun. No, no, no. But, but uh, there's one thing I just shot my daughter before. There's one thing when you're in, uh, in the army, you're overseas and you're away from home, you don't think of your family. You don't think of your wife. You don't think of your kids. You don't think of your mother. You think of you going and coming back. If you went and didn't come back, it ended for you. Sure, sure. Well, how did you? Did you stay in touch with your, your parents and family back in the U.S.? 
Were you able to stay in touch with family back in the United States? And I can't hear. Were you able to stay in touch with people back in the United States? Yeah. Letters, can you just tell us about that? Well, you couldn't, you couldn't send anything back because everything was censored. The, the, the intelligence department censored everything you wrote. You couldn't say what was going on. Of course, of course, they don't want anybody else to know what was going on. Did you get mail from the U.S.? Mm -hmm. did, you, did you get mail? I got mail. And I used to get mail on in field. Casbah, DiCifano, blah, blah, blah. And you'd read your letter and it said, you're only limited to write so much on uh, on a... Uh, on they call that email or something the, the like email, that. Yeah, email. yeah. And, uh, that's how we corresponded home. Good, good. Anything else about St. Mary Glees? Does anything else about the village, the town of St. Mary Glees stand out? St. Mary Glees, there was a big bound. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Iowa, I would, in St. Mary Glees, we had an incident where our sergeant, his name was Horace Rappaport, he was from Long Island, he was our sergeant. And he didn't like Italian names, you know, Italian people. So he picked, he picked five, he picked five GIs. Casbah, Di Stefano, Scofani, Piazza, Five guys, he says, go up to the front line and find out what's going on. You know, see the front line. So I said to him, we talked to the guys, and I said to him, we're not going. Why? Because you're not coming with us. He says, if you don't go, I'm going to have you court martial. I said, you know, that would be the safest thing that could happen to us. So he court martial. He he charged us with uh, insubordination, not taking orders. So we went before the adjutant general. He said to me, I told the five guys that they can go up the front line. What happened? I said, well, our sergeant told us to go up the front line, but he didn't want to come with us. He said, what? Yeah, he said, he says, we had to go up and find out what was going on and report back to him. I said to the adjutant general, how the hell can you report back to him if he got shot and killed? There was no report. But if he was there, he could see what was going on and he could communicate with his phones and tell him what's going on. Dismiss. Get out of here. Yeah. Good. Good for you. Good yeah. for you. Uh, eventually, though, you, you got out of Normandy, right? You left Normandy and, uh, and moved further in. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the, the trucks? And uh, and where I was staying? Yes. In London? No, no, no. After St. Mary Glees. Oh, after St. Mary Glees. Of, of Normandy. We, we went on to Ball and Duke, a city called Ball and Duke. That wasn't too bad. We, along the way, going to Ball and Duke. There was a plane shot down, and inside the plane, there was the pilot still sitting in his seat. So, the captain said to us, nobody touched that pilot because uh, the Germans probably booby trapped him, and they did. They put a grenade where he sat, when he was in the thing, and if you removed him, you were gone too. Right. <clears throat> I saw that later you ended up in the, the Ardennes Forest. Where? The Ardennes Forest. The Ardennes? Yes. Well, I went to Paris. We were there, when they labor ready in Paris. We was in Paris. And uh, had a very funny incident happen. One of the women come up to my friend Salvatore Piazza, John Corrin, and myself. There was a Greek guy called Suriopoulos, 
Constantine Syriopoulos, and this woman had two little kids, and she asked us for uh, two dollars to buy a quart of milk. So I said to her, you have no milk? She said, no. I said, wait a while. I went back to our company where we come from, and went in a supply truck, I took two gallons of dry milk. Stole them. Stole them. That was your life in the army. You steal to survive. Because if you didn't steal, they stole from you. So you, you, if you were first, you take first. So I gave her two bottles of milk, dry milk, not fresh milk. And she gave me a watch off her hand. I still have the watch in here. It's a, a French Chapard watch. I have it, it's in my closet. Okay. And uh, she thanked me very much. And no men. Hitler had taken all the men out of, out of way every time. He took, he took all the men and put them in the service. You see? And she invited me to go to her apartment. I said, no, it's okay. And we and we went forward. We went ahead to Liège, Belgium, and that's where I stood nine months in Liège, Belgium. And I stood at a place called 19 Rue Benedine with Marguerite and Margaret Dupont. They were very nice Belgian people. The Belgian people were very nice to us. Very good. But when we stood at 19 Rue Benedine, there was a bridge that went from the, the civilian part of town to the business part of town, over the Meuse River. And every night, the soldiers, of course, went over the bridge to go. When they were coming back, the French collaborators or the Belgian collaborators, guys that Hitler left behind to see what was going on, it shoot and kill the soldiers, and they'd lay on a bridge. So my uh, lieutenant said, this happened three or four nights in a row, three or four guys every night, laying on a bridge dead. It happens again, and we're gonna blow the house apart. And he did. He blew the house from me, went on the other side, took a tank and shot the house up. That ended everything. In the age Belgium, there was a very nice place. They had some food. They had uh, French scones. They bake on a Friday and sell them on a Saturday. People had nothing to eat. It was a funny thing. You didn't see any kids. There was no kids until one day. The department of, uh, the engineer department come to a coal mine. And uh, it was not an electric shaft yet. They used the rope and they went down. It was 200 kids in a mine, in a, in a coal mine, that the mothers and fathers put them there and every night they'd bring them something to eat. When the kids come out of the mine, we adopted four of them. We took four kids with us throughout the, up until we got to Art, the Ardennes in, in uh, Bastogne. And when we got there, we let the kids go. They were a little bigger and they knew where to go, you know. But other than that, it was uh, heartbreaking, heartbreaking. I used to take my food, not only me, all the rest of the soldiers, took their food and give it to the kids so they could eat. They used to go and where the Americans chew the garbage, they'd, let, they'd switch the inside of a peanut butter can and lick their fingers. It was a, a very simple, very hard working. How could, you, how could you communicate with the kids? How could you talk with the kids? Could you talk to the kids? To the kids? Yeah. Yeah. We in, talked to them. In English or French or well, Flemish? French, they, they knew him. Yeah. I spoke French pretty good. 
Uh, I had the book, and I, I spoke French pretty good. I got along pretty good with all of them. But when we left them, it was heartbreaking. In fact, in fact, I think one of my kids has got, or oh, oh, my son has the war pictures. I have a picture of the four boys that we had. It's in my war book or somewhere along in my life, in my, in my possessions. But other than that, it was a heartbreaking thing. Yeah. Well, so, and so where did you go after Belgium? You ended at... at we went between Belgium and Luxembourg, Bastogne. That's where they had the Battle of the Balls. There was a hurricane forest. Did you, and I don't know if you ever saw a forest or not, but the trees go full apart. Boom, thousands of them. You, you, you walk, you uh, take you an hour to walk a block. But the Germans had their Mark 7 tanks and knocked down and made a pathway. Made a pathway. So the Germans had promised Hitler Liège, Belgium, for Christmas. And there was 80,000 of them marching down. Now, this is an adult story. My, my granddaughter and my daughter's here. I don't want them to feel offended. But these 80,000 soldiers, the weather was cold, 21 degrees below zero. Planes couldn't fly. Our planes couldn't fly. So, and we couldn't shoot down on them because then they knew there were soldiers up in the mountain on the ridge. So the lieutenant said, no shooting down on them. Leave them go. This is one story that I want the world to know. The German soldier dressed green. Their officers dressed Gray and green with black stripes. These part of the eighty thousand was coming our way. The guy, the lieutenant in front of him, come across three dead bodies. Two were Germans and one was an American. He went over to the uh, American soldier that was laying on the side of the road where they were walking. He took his little guy out and shot him three times in the head. The guy was dead already. What the hell do you have to shoot him for? Then he went to the German soldiers, and he took out their ID, and he put him in his pocket. He was a dunyay. He went back to the uh, American soldiers and peed on him. I said to my lieutenant and to the guys that were with us, Man, leave him alone. He's mine. I, if I come across that, that son of a bitch, I'm going to kill him. The lieutenant said to me, be my guest, though. <laughs> so, then we were up on a ridge, sleeping on ice and snow with a pup tent, can of stone off the heat, and, uh, Suddenly the sky cleared. Our P-38s took off from the air base at Liège and shooting down on these guys or whoever they could. A lot of instances in between, but it didn't mean nothing. Fortunately, that one guy that shot, he come our way, had his hands on his head. We come off the ridge, and I said to the guys, man, he's mine. There was four of us, Salvatore Piazza, John Carr, and me, and Syriopolis. So I says, okay. So when we got down, they had their hands on their head. They were going to Bastogne. But what they did was, when they passed the sign that said Bastogne South, they turned it around north, so you would walk into their men. We knew that they knew it right away. The guy, a lot of guys complained, said that sign is wrong. Don't follow that sign. Well, anyway, 
I scattered towards us, and this soldier that did what I told you he did, come our way. He was a he was a German. So he was he was uh, he was uh, another general, an officer, whatever he was. From, from the German army, though. Yeah, from yeah, the okay. German army. Mm -hmm. So we walked, come off the ridge, come down. They would move because they, they knew they were trapped. The, uh, the English were on this side, Canadians were on this side. And let me tell you something nobody knows. The Russians were a big part for us winning the war. They had them trapped. The Russians took no prisoners. No prisoners. You, got, you were German, you were shot on the spot. You the army. And uh, they, uh, you got to come towards us. So uh, I walked up, walked up, freezing my ass off, walked up out of uh, uh, emblem rifle that they give you. I went to him like this. Next, no, 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 Take a walk. Come over me. Take a walk. End the story. Then they come back, and the uh, colonel said to me, uh, lieutenant said to me, Lou, that was a good thing you did. That's nice. It's okay. I'll recommend something. I said, I don't want none. I want to get the hell out of here. So, Anyway, I said, Seymour, I'm not done. I'm going back to him. He said, why? I'm going to pee on him. He said, you just shot a guy. You killed him and shot him. And now you want to do the same? You can't do that. I ain't going to let you do that. So I didn't do it. Well, good. <laughs> okay. That's a true story. Yeah, no, that's... Yeah. You, know, you can't make these stories up. It's true. I, I totally believe you. Yeah. And... Uh, when we took prisoners to USA, to USA Command, High Command, sent a notice, do not take any prisoners. We have no room for them. We can't supply them, we can't feed them, we can't clothe them. Don't take any prisoners. And take their shirts off and under their armpit, they had SS. The stormtroopers, shoot them right on the spot. But the guys took care of that. I had the Luger that this lieutenant had. I had his Luger. But when I was coming home, they drilled a hole in it, in the barrel, so I couldn't use it. So I left it there. Now, yeah. Did you ever have, did you ever hear of any stories of German soldiers putting on American uniforms? Putting on what? American uniforms? Oh yeah, yeah. Could you tell us about that? And in, in Bastogne, on the way to Bastogne, these soldiers were directing tra traffic, and they would tell us, "Hey, what the hell is going on here?" That not seem right. They were American. They were uh, German soldiers dressed in American uniform. That was in Luxembourg, Bastogne, near the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, I'd heard, I'd heard about that. That's uh, that's interesting. I'd heard about that in the history. Oh, well, it's true. Yeah. It's true. I, I saw it. It's true. Mm -hmm. They were dressed up as uh, American soldiers. Spoke English fluently. Of course, I graduated. Some graduated in in the United States College and went to Germany, and Hitler grabbed them right in the right and uh, put them right in the army. Now uh, I don't know if a lot of people know this from what I heard and what I knew in Germany. Hitler c killed a lot of Jews. You know why? He was a chancellor like a congressman or a senator. And it was the Kaiser was the head of the chancellor. And he didn't like the Kaiser. And he said, he asked uh, uh, the manufacturers of uh, 
in manufacture of Germany, which put together a lot of book binders, a lot of uh, glass glass makers, glass blowers, made the best Christmas ornaments in the world, and uh, crystal, a lot of crystal. He says, well, you don't support me now? When I get to be the head of Germany, I'll get even with you. And from what I hear, he cremated millions of them. Shot, killed millions of them. After, um, after the Battle of the Bulge, did you ever get into Germany yourself? I, got, I went into a little part of Germany called Sine. C-I-N-E-Y, Sine. And it was on January 23rd, 1946. I was called off, carried my report to the rear, and they sent me to Paris to uh, for rehab. I was going home. War ended for me. When I got to Paris, I met my brother. I met my brother. Oh, you met, okay, you met your brother in Paris. Tell yeah. us about that. In the rehab. He was very happy to go home. Oh, so happy to meet him. And uh, he left. And I said to him, tell mom and dad, I'll be home in about two weeks. And that's when, that's when I left. When I, now, when I left, when I left, I was in the harbor, in the harbor of France, going on the boat, the ship to take us home. There was a haberdasher selling jackets in an open air closet. There's two two suede jackets. I'll tell you a real story. I bought a jacket, an Eisenhower jacket. So the man said to me, Do you want an lining on that? I said, Yeah. He said, Of course, an extra 10 bucks. I said, Okay, put it on. So he put the lining. No, we were leaving. He said, I'll sh I'll, what kind of lining do you want? I said, I'll put one on of anything you know. Get, open that closet. He put, it, he put a lining in my jacket, which I have now here. Okay. A complete uh, map of the war. Wow. I got the jacket. Yeah, well, well we can... We we can go no, this, this is this guy, yeah. Yeah, we, 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 that's good, that's good, we can look at I'll it. I'll show it to you. Yeah, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see I, that. And I left to come home for 23 days, cross come home. When we come home, we landed on 86th Street, on one a wall. Of course, I lived right across the river. And then I, uh, <laughs> I, left, I left everything to go home and see my mother and father. How was, how was that seeing your parents again? Huh? How was that, getting home and seeing your parents? Oh, Tell my about God. Uh, my mother. Oh, God. She was so grateful. Good mother. One of the best. Were your brothers already home? They were home, well, yeah. Everybody was home. home safe? Oh, well, I had ended for them. They come home. So everybody was, was home safe? Yeah, they were, they were. I come home in uh, Feb January, February. The, uh, my birthday was on the 11th. I come home on the 23rd or the 24th, something like that. Did you go back to the Army, though? Did I go back to where? Did you go back to the Army after... Uh, after you went home, did you go back to muster yeah. out? Yeah. I remember you, you got your discharge. Oh, yeah. Why don't you hold that up for the camera even for a second? Uh, uh, oh, yeah. After I got home, I went back to get discharged. Yeah. Okay. Four months. Okay. Guy said to me, where were you? I said, I went home. <laughs> he said, what for? I said, I haven't seen my family for three years. Yeah. So he said. Yeah. That's yeah, no, that's good. So you, uh, I want to read this. Yeah, uh, honor, honorable discharge. So you, so you didn't active, get... Normandy, northern France, Ardennes, and Rhineland. 
got out of my discharge. But you did, so you didn't get in any trouble? Yeah. You didn't get in trouble. That's cool. I went back and uh, he said to me, uh, do you want to go get checked out a rehab? I said, no. I, I, I went completely deaf from my left ear, from the bombs and sleeping on the cold ground. I lost my hearing at it. And this one, on this side, I heard maybe 45 or 50%. But I managed to hear a few yell diamond. When I got back, it was the hardest thing in the world is adjusting to civilian life. I was sleeping in Palisade Park and down the bottom of the, on Route 46 in Little Ferry, there was the air, airfield, Teterboro Airport. Sure. The planes used to fly and land. I, th I thought I was being asked to wake up at night. I went on for about five years. But I say this, the people of this country, the American people, the young boys, the young girls, the mothers and fathers, Respect the veteran. Respect them, help them as much as you can. A lot of our politicians, they're rotten politicians, they never mention a veteran when they're running for office. And if they get in office, they do nothing for them. I don't think that's right. What, what did you do after the war? For, uh, what, was, did you, what was your job? What did you My, do? After the war, I went to, I went to college. Cook College in Princeton, and I, I took a public health course, and I became a health inspector. In fact, I retired in 92 as a health inspector. That's good, that's good. War is not fun. And there's no GI or anybody in the world. President Kings can tell you what war is like because it changes from one minute to the other. One minute you're being shot at, one minute you're eating, the next minute you're dead. So how do you know how war is? It's not a pleasant thing. It's not. And it's something that never leaves your mind. Right. Because I lost a lot of friends. I lost a lot of friends. I think of them all the time. Yeah, you, you had some, uh, some tough battles. You had some tough battles. Mm -hmm. You were in some tough battles. Yeah. 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 No, that's... Um, well, we're, get, we're getting towards the... We're getting towards the end of the questions. I've got two more questions, though, for you. Uh, what, two, more, two more questions. Is there one thing that you'd really like your, your, your kids and your grandkids to really know uh, about your wartime service? They never asked me to think about wartime service. I never spoke anything about the war for 50 years. It wasn't a pleasant thing to speak about. And my kids and my wife, may she rest in peace, a good woman, never asked me a question about the war. I never talked about the war, never thought about the war. Because it wasn't a pleasant thing to think about. And I still don't think about the war. But then at night, sometimes when I'm alone in here, I think of my life. I go over my life. There's my first, my first kid born, and life was different. Was different. They never asked me anything. I never told them nothing. I went deaf. And let me tell you this story. When my wife was alive, we got along pretty good. She was collecting Social Security. I was collecting Social Security. I was working. But after she died, I had it tough. And I filed for disability. My daughter's there, she'll tell you. One year, knocked down, filed again for disability. Why are you filing for disability? I can't hear, I'm deaf. Knocked down. Third year, 
knocked down. So, after the third year, I wrote a letter and told them, I want to no more correspondence. I want to be heard in person. So they sent me a letter to go to the 12th floor of the Prudential Center in Newark somewhere, and I went. Four guys sitting down. I walk in with the letter, and the guy said to me, Sir, what are you doing here? I showed them the letter. Oh, he says, sit down. He said, Lewis, let me ask you, how old are you? I says, uh, I was about 85. Uh, I says, uh, I'm 85. Oh, you get along pretty good. I said, yeah. Sir, could I ask you a question? How old are you? He said, 47. I said, what the hell do you know about war? Would you have an action? And you're going to judge me? No. I'm deaf. I want to be going to the hospital. Ed took me to the hospital. The doctor was your doctor, Rishi. She said to, she said to Ed, your father's, <laughs> your father's completely deaf. So while we're talking to these poor guys, he looked at my papers. He said, Lewis, you could go home. Oh, I said, now you're chasing me? He said, yeah, you could go home. I said, okay. So I left. Okay. They knew nothing about it. Am I right, Ian? They knew nothing about it. About two weeks later, I get a check for $85,000. They granted me the three years that I filed for. That, that's how I live here. But uh, I need help. I need some, some organization has got to help me. Because at the end of the month, I don't have enough. And I don't know if you know any organization that help the best. Well, is there, is there anything else that you wanted to, uh, is there anything else you wanted to, to talk about? Or did, did you guys have any yeah. questions? Well, my kids. They're the best kids in the world, boy. They helped me a lot. And their mother, they loved their mother. And I had the best wife in the world, the best mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother you ever wanted me. She was a nice person. Now the kids can, kids can verify that. Yeah. That's it. But well, we would like to, I would like to give you, this has been a great opportunity for me to get to talk to you. I'm so today. pleased. It's a pleasure to talk to you. But on behalf of the museum, oh, I'd like to give you, you this. We call them the challenge coins. Oh, I'm going to keep that. Yeah, maybe you can hold it up for the camera if you want. And uh, I appreciate your, your time.